And so without further ado, what we're going to do first is have uh, Didier Stenier come up and give a talk. Um, the first zebrafish meeting I went to was, I'm not even going to say the year, but it was still at Cold Spring Harbor. And there was a talk about cloche, and I thought it was the coolest mutant ever. And so it's really fantastic to have DDA come up now and tell us what cloche actually is. So here's DDA. Thank you, Becky. It's uh, also my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the organizers uh, for the, uh, allowing me to present this data. And uh, the work really started back in 1983 when uh, this paper was published and inspired many of us to join the zebrafish field and uh, used the system to do forward genetics. And uh, in 1996, this uh, famous publication came out that really summarized and tabulated thousands of mutants identified through the MGH and tubing and screens. And of course, these screens were followed by many screens in Eugene and many other places around the world. And out of these uh, thousands of loci, hundreds of genes have been identified and really have helped kickstart the field and, of course, uh, build the community as we know it uh, now. So, Cloche was actually published before this uh, publication because, in fact, as you'll see in a minute, the first allele was not from an ENU mutagenesis, but in fact was a background mutation in a, uh, a semi-wild population of fish from Indonesia. But uh, the reason or the way this, uh, this uh, mutant was first identified was because of the uh, heart dysfunction. As you can see, this uh, bell-shaped heart is not, as I'll show you in a minute, a wild-type configuration. Here you're seeing the atrium, which is expanded, and the ventricle, which is uh, shortened. And uh, cloche, of course, means bell in French. Now, this mutant, as Becky said, uh, attracted our attention and that of other many other people in the field because it lacks most endothelial and most blood cells. And of course, uh, the development of the cardiovascular system was rapidly gaining ground in terms of being a, a, a favorite uh, study or a favorite topic of study in the zebrafish field. So, just to uh, orient you a, few, a little more here, we have the wild type on the left, the mutant on the right. And uh, essentially, uh, what uh, you see is uh, that uh, the endocardium, which is the endothelial lining of the heart, you can clearly see it in the wild type embryos and missing in the mutants, both in the Namaski as well as in the cross section. And as I mentioned to you, the M39 allele, which was the first uh, allele identified, came from the, this uh, wild, uh, semi-wild uh, population. And it's important to note also that uh, later on, from a number of ENU screens, including the uh, MGH screens, a number of alleles were found, ENU-induced alleles, indicating that uh, a single gene might be responsible when mutated for this phenotype. The, um, Evidence, some of the evidence that uh, in fact uh, it's a, an early gene in this pathway comes from this study, which was published many years later by another group, but essentially shows you that uh, both are looking at the uh, expression pattern of uh, FLIC1, a VEGF receptor 2, you can see again on the left the wild type and on the right the mutants, you can see that in fact most endothelial cells are missing from uh, the mutant embryos. And a macrophage marker, L-plastin, again shows you, the in-situ show you that in fact most macrophages are missing, and similar with the GATA1 uh, or red blood cells are missing also from these uh, mutants. And so essentially, going back to the original paper back in 95, uh, some transplant experiments by Brandt had showed that in fact this gene clash is required cell autonomously so that when you put wild-type cells into mutant embryos, you can restore part of the endocardium. The situation with the blood is a little more complicated. Uh, Leon Parker and I published a paper uh, a number of years later showing that in fact it's required, Clash appears to be required cell non autonomously for the differentiation of mesodermal cells into GATA1 expressing cells. And uh, we may come back to this point later on. So a, uh, a number of uh, other studies by our group as well as the uh, Lenzon's group showed and in fact and confirmed, this was now back in the late 90s, that uh, 
as I showed you in this slide with the institutes earlier, that uh, it appears to act upstream of VEGF receptor 2 or FLIC1, also appears to act upstream of another transcription factor called SCL and TAL1 that we'll be using later on in the study that uh, in fact is also a, a early regulator of blood and endothelial cell differentiation. The uh, study by uh, Debbie Yellen a number of years later showed that in fact in clutch mutants there's also an increased number of cardiomyocytes. All these data point to an early role for clutch in diversification of the mesoderm as uh, represented here. So shortly after the bifurcation of mesenderm into mesoderm and endoderm, and specifically looking at the anterior lateral plate mesoderm, you can see that clutch acts a very early step in essentially driving the lineage towards blood and endothelial cells. Now, in addition to people interested in early mesoderm diversification, people were also interested in the role of blood and endothelial cells in a number of biological processes and of course we're using this unique mutant in terms of looking at the effect on their favorite process of the endothelial and blood lineages. And so for this reason, this mutant became very useful to a number of people in the field. And of course, many questions arose as to what the identity of the gene might be. And uh, it was, of course, a very frustrating search, not only for us, but uh, a number of people in the community and uh, we felt that uh, as a community we needed to show to the mouse and fly people that in fact positional cloning was uh, something that became, became routine in the fish field. So the mapping of the gene uh, we initially published in uh, 2000 and this was before essentially there was a good genetic map so we actually had to use amplified fragment length polymorphisms which uh, some of you, a few of you might remember uh, this was the very early days now, and we found some closely linked markers. The uh, second uh, genetic map led us to more better markers. Z496 is one marker that was very close to Clash. And uh, as you can notice, the last sentence of that uh, section indicates that in fact we uh, predicted that this would be a, a gene very hard to clone because it was uh, located at the telomere of uh, chromosome 13. And of course, the telomere, uh, uh, because of the high uh, incidence of repeat, it's very hard then to essentially get and uh, maintain large insert clones from back or yak libraries. So the only way that uh, we might be able to get to the gene, we figured, was to essentially map it to very high resolution. And Sukwan and Neil and a number of technicians helped to, in fact, genotype more than 10,000 embryos and to get a very close, uh, very high resolution map. They also managed to get one distal marker, although that was based on a single mutant embryo, which always uh, had us a little worried. And so essentially being in the telomere, as many of you know, is problematic in any organism with a good genome. And uh, of course, this was also problematic for the zebrafish genome. The first problem was that there were gaps everywhere you can see here more than 10 gaps in this uh, fairly small region and that unfortunately the assembly uh, particularly in this region and I won't comment on the other regions but uh, the assembly was not very high, uh, very precise. So essentially this then uh, was a period of time when it was hard to convince people in the lab to start working on this project. Uh, and uh, we knew, of course, that other people in Boston and other parts of uh, the US and Europe were also working on it. But essentially, a few people were brave enough. And um, essentially, the, the workflow uh, looked like this. We would uh, try and assemble full-length cDNA, sequence the mutant in the wild type alleles, do some RNA rescues. Occasionally, we use morpholinos. And uh, we looked at genes like LBH, Lycat, uh, PTKV7B, and so on. I'll come back to LICAT in a minute. And this was the work of Sukhwan Jin, Neil, Sven, Ali, and so on. We also tried to assemble the Clash region at, uh, uh, subsequently, uh, first using whole genome sequencing. We also worked with BGI, make new phosmid libraries. We were looking at other fish genomes, trying to take advantage of synteny conservation. And uh, eventually, um, 
we were getting some hints. Uh, some morpholinos seem to cause cloche-like phenotypes. Some RNA rescues seem to improve and rescue the phenotype. And so in a way, we were not surprised when this uh, paper came out, which are based on morpholino data, as well as rescue data, claimed that in fact, LICAT might be the CLOSH gene. And uh, it was convincing enough for Zephin to change the name of CLOSH to LICAT. We pointed out to them that in fact, there was no, uh, in this uh, paper, uh, they had never been able to find a severe lesion or a lesion of any kind in the LICAT gene. And so Zephin uh, agreed to reverse the name to CLOSH. And so we were back on uh, search and uh, decided to start essentially back from the drawing board. And uh, this M39 allele, which I mentioned uh, early on, which was the spontaneous allele, appeared to be a potentially good reagent in the sense that if you were to look at genes from now ZV10, ZV9, and ZV10, and look at their expression pattern, or sorry, their level of expression between mutants and wild type, you could see that some genes were completely non-expressed. Some, of course, were upregulated. And so essentially the approach was very simple, and uh, we are not the only ones who came up with this approach. And essentially we would then use the CLOSH deletion allele at the right stage and identify all the genes that are now expressed in the mutant versus the wild type. Now, of course, the key here, and I think the reason other people did not get where we managed to get eventually was to choose what the right stage would be. Because of course, if you look too late, then you're gonna get all the downstream genes that are also gonna be differentially regulated. So we looked back at our data, other people's data, and uh, decided that essentially look based on the basis of the uh, regulation, the expression of genes associated with blood and then the three cell differentiation, CLOSH would be probably expressed and functional prior to the end of gastrulation. I also want to point your attention to ETV2 and TAL1, two transcription factors that are essentially a, a early uh, regulators of endothelial and blood differentiation that we'll be using later on uh, during the talk. So essentially, we uh, hypothesized that CLOSH was expressed sometime between six and 10 hours, and so devised a strategy whereby we would generate and collect large number of wild-type siblings and mutant embryos we would essentially extract RNA and DNA from individual embryos. This was back now in 2011. And uh, we would genotype them with a marker that's in the deletion and a marker on another chromosome to be able to, to identify wild types versus mutants and essentially pool RNA from wild types and pool RNA from mutants, sequence both poly as well as total RNA. This was now, as I said, 2011. NIH was uh, already giving uh, people trouble, so we had to uh, join forces with Lumina. Gary uh, saw this as a challenge, and uh, fortunately uh, was able to help us uh, generate a high number of reads. And uh, we started working with uh, JGI, as well as uh, people in our lab, to try and assemble these data. Key help came from Milo Lee, uh, postdoc, uh, then a postdoc with Antonio Hildes. And essentially, you can see down at the telomere of chromosome 13 are uh, most of the genes that are differentially regulated at this stage between CLOSH mutants and uh, wild-type siblings. And on this, we decided to essentially focus on 16 genes, and the idea was to mutate each of these genes, and now we've moved uh, to the uh, Max Planck Institute uh, near Frankfurt, and we're able to hire uh, Nana, the, uh, an amazing technician, who essentially took care of uh, this long list of uh, mutant projects. And uh, so this is how the list looked like uh, a bit less than a year ago. Uh, essentially, uh, there was, we would, of course, cross the founders to the M39 allele. We would intercross the F1s, and you can see, and uh, we can come back to this point as well, but uh, that uh, we had no phenotype, uh, no vascular phenotype, and essentially no phenotype in any of these mutants. There were still a few genes on the list. And ZV10 was released at that point. We convinced Milo to reanalyze the data, and he found a new gene and this unassigned CARTIC here. And uh, this, of course, uh, was uh, provided another candidate. It turned out that it mapped right next to our distal marker, so it was definitely in the region. It was uh, uh, definitely a good candidate gene. And on September 25th is uh, when we saw the phenotype. So 
at this point, this was, of course, uh, The last gene on the list, of course. And uh, at this point, of course, I, we decided to, uh, Sven, Ali, and Ali decided to set aside all their other projects and uh, complete, uh, essentially, and gather evidence that we had found the right gene. Uh, this was just a phenotype now in a deletion, uh, or in the complementation with a deletion. So we needed to make sure that. Uh, we're not going to be wrong on this one. So what is the evidence? Uh, the mapping, I've told you about the genetic mapping, a very high resolution map. We've managed to close the gap between chromosome 13 and this unassigned contig and position this gene right in this, uh, essentially this gap. We've done complementation tests not only with the deletion allele, but also with the ENU allele, S5 being a ENU-induced allele from uh, San Francisco screen. We have, a, as I'll show you in a minute, the uh, severe lesion in the S5 allele. We've done mRNA rescues, and we've also done some morphine work. And so here's the protein. As you can see, it's a transcription factor, uh, which also has some pass domains, has some putative transactivation domains. The CRISPR allele, of course, we had identified a short fragment in the three prime end of the gene, so we could only mutate that part of it. And then we have, as I said, a severe lesion in the S5 allele, which is a stop codon in the first pass domain. The CRISPR allele, as you might anticipate, is a weak allele, and whereas in the, uh, essentially, in the original alleles that we had worked with, there was no endocardial cells, you can see here that, in fact, in this weak allele, you can see some endocardial cells. So now I'm just going to go and see where this gene is expressed and then do some gain-of-function experiments to, in fact, try. And we knew this gene was necessary for endothelial and blood differentiation, but we wanted to see where, in fact, or how potent it was and, and where it, uh, in fact, lies in this pathway. So it is expressed very transiently, as you can see here. So the uh, essentially peak of expression is around mid-gastrulation stages. By 24 hours, it is uh, strikingly downregulated. It precedes the expression of TAL1 and ETV2. And in fact, if you look uh, in the EST collection for zebrafish, there are no ESTs for this gene. In fact, in all the genomes that we've looked at now, there are no ESTs for this gene, which uh, speaks uh, highly to its a very transient and specific expression pattern. If you look by in situ, you can see a pattern very similar to what is seen with ETV2 or TAL1 expression. And also, as you can see at Talbot, uh, you have uh, expression of this gene prior to ETV2 or TAL1 expression. Now, we've also done uh, some work with Gu Zhang Chang in uh, Japan, looking at the uh, chick homologue. And again, you can see uh, that uh, this gene comes on during early gastrulation and is rapidly downregulated. And if you look at the expression pattern of uh, this gene compared to TAL1, again, you can see very, uh, like a very similar expression pattern. So we haven't, or the Goujon has not started the functional uh, experiments yet, but uh, it looks uh, that it might play a very similar role uh, in birds. When you overexpress, or downregulate ETV2 or TAL1 using morpholinos, you can see no effect on NPAS4 expression. And this is, again, just to show you some of the morpholino data with ETV2 or TAL1, you can see that uh, CLOSH is, in fact, uh, its expression pattern is not perturbed. On the other hand, if you overexpress CLOSH, you can see high upregulation and throughout the embryo of ETV2 and TAL1. And in fact, if you do qPCR, you can see that some of these targets, like FLE1B, are upregulated a thousandfold to ATV2 and TAL1 up to a hundredfold. So a very potent transcriptional activator. So essentially, this brings me to the model where we have CLASH, which is necessary and sufficient for the differentiation of endothelial and blood cells and stream of ATV2 and TAL1. So what really is this protein? It is part of the, as I said, this uh, class of BHLH pass domain containing transcription factors. It's most closely related to NPAS4 and stands for neuronal 
and so it's a gene that's been implicated in memory formation. And uh, it's a part of a family that contains both class one and class two proteins that have to heterodimerize. And some of you might recognize proteins like HIF1, AHR, and of course the Clark genes, uh, Clark and others. And so essentially, we uh, presume that uh, CLASH has, in fact, uh, being a class one BHLH protein, uh, heterodimerizes with uh, class two, probably a aunt or aunt and aunt two, as I'll come to in a minute. Now, interestingly, this gene is only present from lampreys to birds. As you can see, uh, and of course you have to remember that the Ethereum is a vertebrate invention, so, it, so you can see it in lampreys but not in tunicates, and similarly you cannot find this gene in tunicates. And so of course it's been a, it's uh, initially somewhat puzzling as to what the mammalian uh, orthologs or functional orthologs might be. There's evidence, published uh, data, on the involvement of some class 1 and class 2 BHLH plus proteins in the differentiation of blood and endothelial cells. Uh, some of them are shown here. And in fact, if you make the double mutant between ART and ART2, uh, two, in fact, you lose most endothelial cells. So we think that, again, there's redundancy as far as the class 2 proteins. Now, what about the class 1 proteins? Certainly, n 4 mutants, uh, which have been uh, uh, is described and studied mostly by Mike Greenberg at Harvard, survived to adulthood, which is how they can uh, determine their function in memory formation. But uh, we wanted to see if, in fact, uh, it might be expressed at the right time. And so we joined forces with uh, Alec Witte and Neil Chi at UCSD, and they differentiated human ES cells into endothelial cells. And so the key times here are day four, uh, the differentiation protocol when you start seeing endothelial cells. So in red here is NPAS4 expression. And you can see, for example, pretty potent markers like OCT4 is uh, down-regulated by the time uh, uh, NPAS4 comes on. If you look at these dermal genes like Bracurium SP1, you can see again NPAS4 comes on as these mesodermal markers come down. And then ETV2, the expression pattern looks very similar to NPAS4, and then the later the endothelial genes like FLE1, CDH5, and PCAM1 come on later on. So it's possible that in uh, human and mouse, NPAS4 may in fact be playing a role, of course, redundantly with another uh, class 1 BHLH protein in endothelial and blood differentiation. And so the hypothesis then is that in fact NPAS4 and another uh, class 1, possibly AHR, function redundantly and assume the role of clutch in mammals, and this is a hypothesis that we're not testing. So moving forward, of course, uh, we have to understand what regulates this uh, very specific expression temporally and spatially of clutch. We've, of course, looked at a number of downstream targets and uh, identified several that show uh, very similar expression patterns than, than clutch does. We have to better understand the role of this protein in the uh, blood formation, as I told you, uh, and you may uh, not have noticed, but in fact, uh, overexpressing clutch does not lead to upregulation of GATA1. So as indicated by the transplant experiments that Leon Parker had uh, generated, it's a, a more complicated story than the, with the endothelium. And of course, we have to think about the hemogenic endothelium in this context. And uh, as, as I said, it remains to be shown which of these class 1 and class 2 VHLs pass proteins are in fact playing a role, uh, the cloche-like role in mammals. And I just want to end with this quote about, uh, from Ira, the late Ira Herskovitz, who uh, in fact um, was a colleague of George Streisinger in Eugene, and uh, I think uh, he, Ira, and uh, uh, George really uh, together, I think, uh, or Ira had, I think, some influence on uh, George as far as thinking about forward genetics. And uh, in fact, Ira helped uh, me revise uh, my CLOSH uh, NIH grant uh, back in 1995. So he was a key, a key player in this uh, project in more ways than one. And so again, I'll acknowledge uh, the key people that have been driving this project, Sven, Ali, and Ali, who have finally broke the puzzle. Uh, as I said, there have been many people in my lab who worked on this project over the years. Uh, we had helped uh, as far as sequencing and bioinformatics, uh, and I mentioned the uh, tail and CRISPR work in human ES cells. Uh, 
and of course the funding sources. And so I'll thank you for your attention and be happy to take questions.